So the close call file, you know, if you read in the anxiety audit, the story that I tell about what happened in the first chapter about my close call that happened when the car went out into traffic, the more you think about it, the more that you lay down those pathways, the more that you create the story, the stronger it gets. So you want to make a conscious decision when it pops up to unhook from it and it gets better over time. Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. Lynn, I thought we should talk about what's actually gone on in your life of recent days because it's been pretty intense and there have been a lot of feelings. So why don't you tell us what happened? Okay. So about two weeks ago from when we're recording this, I was going down a staircase at my parents' house. I was carrying a chair over my head. I was wearing socks, all of which have been pointed out to me were not a good idea. And I... My feet went out from under me and I landed on a very hard stair and I fractured my back in two places. So I broke my back basically. Twice. Twice. Yeah. One is a little crack and one is broken. So if you have to fracture your back, if you have to break your back, I did it in the best way possible. And that's what they told me after I got the CAT scan. You are in the best case scenario of fracturing your back. Because my back, my spine is completely stable, no spinal cord damage. It will heal completely. I've got a four to six week recovery where I can't twist or bend. I'm already so much better two weeks after this injury, so much better. But it was bad. It was bad. It was bad. It was bad. Bad for the whole family, as <laughs> you can imagine. And I uh, was telling a friend of mine that this had happened. And I think it's very interesting to think about the skills that you have spent your life developing in emotional management, those skills can really shine when they are reasonable to show up in moments even like this. And I think that that's kind of what might be an interesting episode is that bad things like this happen. How do you show up to them with a little bit more emotional management? And what would it look like if you didn't? And I think you can kind of walk us through. And this is like a little bit of a painful experiential learning exercise. Oh, yeah. It was totally painful. Can we just talk about the fact also for you listeners of the podcast? Do you remember Lynn's big trigger of what she really dislikes historically that actually causes like a fainting kind of feeling with her broken bones? Yeah, that's right. And one of my clients who is cute as a button and smart as a whip. One of my first sessions back after I started working again, she said to me, and you know, this must have been so hard for you because don't you have trouble with broken bones? And I was like, yes, I do. Really, like if the universe is going to F with you, this was a big, big F. It really is quite interesting. Yeah. So I've been an observer of my own self during this. There are a lot of challenges. So certainly the pain was challenging. There are so many different ways in which this sort of stops you in your tracks, like literally and figuratively. My schedule, of course, got completely messed up. I had to cancel things. I had a class. So it happened on a Sunday. I had a a master class scheduled for Tuesday and Wednesday that I was so looking forward to. People coming in from all over the country, a group of really skilled clinicians, people that I was so looking forward to spending time with for two days. Done. Canceled. Didn't happen. And of course, everything else got canceled too. So it's been an interesting time of introspection as I've been laying on my back. Right. It's another lockdown. Yeah. Except this one had stricter rules for you, but not everybody else. Correct. So what do you want to know? You want to know how I handle things? Well, take us actually when you, I think this is, you were there with your parents and when you actually had the accident, you were in a lot of pain, but you also still probably responded to this really horrible situation with some awareness. Yeah. So the pain was bad. 
soon after I fell, within probably a minute after I hit the staircase, I knew I was in trouble. I couldn't move. I told my parents to call 911. I have a super high pain tolerance. I've gotten hurt a lot. This was on a whole nother level. I certainly could recognize what was happening in my body. I was going into shock. My blood pressure went incredibly low, which is a vasovagal response also. I was keenly aware of the fact that my poor parents were watching this. I was also worried that they were going to take a chainsaw to my parents' staircase. They had to extract me. It was sort of, for those of you who are in New England, it was like Northwood's Law, but inside a house, not on a mountain. So there was a lot to manage in terms of me letting people know what was going on, being concerned about the other people that were there. I certainly was aware of that. Did you faint a little bit? I'm not sure. I think I might have fainted on the staircase. So I was kind of in and out. I had my eyes closed most of the time, which I recognized later that I didn't open my eyes. So I was really working on trying to stay conscious and stay there. Or here's what I also want to recognize. There was a woman, there was an EMT that was by my ear most of the time. And having somebody else's voice right there, sort of telling me what was going on, reminding me to breathe, letting me know what they were doing was enormously helpful. So I'm very grateful to her. That sort of concrete emotional support was super, super helpful. Mm, That's a good tip. Yeah. So that was really helpful. uh, Just having another, you know, we talk about connection a lot. Having this incredibly solid empathic person right next to me was really, really helpful. Yeah. It took them about 40 minutes to get me off the stairs. At that point, I was pretty sure my back was broken based on what I was feeling. And we didn't know how it was broken. So they were being incredibly careful. And then I got in the ambulance and went to the hospital. Yeah, it was a fun afternoon. On our end, I was actually across the country. I wasn't at home. And so I get a text from my husband, who is your brother, saying that you'd hurt yourself and that your mom had just called and that he was like dashing up there. And it's like a two hour drive for him. So it was an it couldn't be instant. Like in many families, then all of the chain texts start. So I started getting texts from your best friend too. And we were all trying to share information. And I was aware of my own patterns. (laughs) I definitely, when there's a problem, go into solving mode. Yeah. But I also catastrophize the F out of this. (laughs) The first things first was it affects everyone emotionally, even though it affected you emotionally and physically. And everyone's patterns did sort of show up in a predictable way. And then the people who sort of supplant their reactions to solve, I think then like the reaction still comes, it just comes later. Because that's I would say it's what happened with me and my husband about it. And not knowing is, I think, like the worst thing. And even for you, because that happened for you in many different ways over the next 48 hours. Yeah. So immediately I could move my legs. I wasn't having numbness. I wasn't losing feeling anywhere. So that was really helpful to me. It's funny because I sort of, I was very aware, even when I was in the ambulance and they were trying to decide where to take me because my blood pressure was crashing. And I was like, okay, wait, I got to take off my watch and my ring and give it to my parents. I don't want to take these to the hospital with me. I was aware of where people were, how people were doing, making sure I felt like I was like, and they're like, you know, it's fine. We got it. We got it. We got it. I just kept directing things. Like I was in the ambulance saying like, where are my parents? Is my husband here yet? I could feel my sort of need to take care of things and fix things was right there the whole time. Yeah, I was much more concerned for my parents than I was for myself, actually, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, that's who you are. You know, that's that's who you are. You're showing up and caring for everyone. And that's what you chose to do professionally, (laughs) you know. Yeah, not surprisingly. Yeah. Did you, were you effective at getting your watch and your rings and everything to your parents? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I got them off. I gave them to Dick, the EMT. Dick brought them to my parents. They were returned to me last night. They're back on my hand, which I'm grateful for. So yeah, it was pretty effective. And then the hospital was interesting too, because I was also just observing people's ability to connect and be, I was watching people do their job, which was interesting. There was one nurse who was, I thought, as she's talking to me, I'm thinking, 
oh gosh, here's some compassion fatigue right here. <laughs> right? She doesn't she doesn't really give a shit. Like I was really it was kind of interesting. They got me to the bathroom. I found out that the I had the fractures in my back, which again didn't surprise me based on I'd never felt that kind of pain before. So they needed to get me to the bathroom to pee. So they decided I would walk to the bathroom. I didn't make it. They put me in a wheelchair. The nurse handed me over to a lovely LPN. And as the LPN was taking me into the bathroom, the nurse said to her, she fell on some stairs and she's a bit bruised up. So be careful. And I remember thinking, okay, so I have two fractures in my back. You want to give her some more accurate information? And then I proceeded to go into the bathroom with this lovely LPN and pass out. So haha, got you back. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, it was really interesting. She was really like kind of disconnected in a way that was really interesting to observe. Well, and also a pattern she has developed to have the appropriate numbness to get through her day at work. They told me what was wrong. They gave me good information about sort of good information. And then they sent me home. And then and then the Bruins lost in overtime and gave seven, which was just adding insult to injury, literally insult to injury. And now I've been recuperating for the last two weeks. So this is where my catastrophizing comes in. Yeah. As you're texting me that you're going to be sent home that night, I text my husband, your brother. Okay. There's no way she's going home tonight. She's not telling us the truth. (laughs) Okay. And here's the reality is that I was actually lying for a while about the fact that they were sending me home because I knew everybody would freak out when they heard that. So I knew I was going home before I told everybody I was going home because I was like, oh God, I even considered lying to everybody and just saying that I was going to stay in the hospital. But it became clear that staying there was not going to be the most comfortable option for me. It was better to go home. Right. So after all of the incident happens... This is kind of where like this is where the anxiety now is you're home and you can't move and you're in a tremendous amount of pain and it's giving you a lot of opportunity to worry. Yeah. So I had an interesting experience where I woke up one night, the second night, I woke up at about 1230 and I was in a lot of pain. I can't take opiates because they make me vomit. I want to stay away from them anyway. So we're trying to manage the pain with Tylenol and Advil. And I began to believe at 1230, lying in the dark, that there was more wrong than I thought, that the pain was so intense that I began to catastrophize. I began to spiral a little bit. I began to worry that maybe they hadn't seen a crack in my pelvis. How could I have so much pain when the Emergency room doctor said, look, this is the best case scenario. This is going to heal. You're going to be fine. But lying there at 1230 at night by myself in such tremendous pain, I could not move. I started to panic. I really started to panic. And I was awake probably for about three hours. Okay, so that's part one. So I definitely felt myself catastrophizing and felt myself panicking and really having a hard time believing that I was going to be okay. And then in the morning when I, when the sun rose, I actually did something that I don't usually do is that I texted a friend whose husband is an orthopedic surgeon and he was out of the country. And I said, can you get me an appointment today? And I don't usually do that. I don't usually sort of jump to the front of the line, but I jumped to the front of the line. The guy, they got me in. We went over the CAT scan as I was in the appointment and he was showing me where the breaks were and going through everything. I looked at my husband and I said, my blood pressure is dropping. And my husband knows exactly what that means. And then the orthopedic surgeon said, oh, you're one of those. And I go, oh yeah, I'm really one of those. So they just moved me over, had me lie down for a minute and I was fine. So here's the other thing I learned is that, which I know, and I know this from my clinical work too, is that accurate information is really, really helpful. And somebody who's an expert and knows what they're doing and tells you what's going on is so, so helpful. And I know that in my job every day, I know that. Let's talk about that after we come back from our break. Okay. Lynn, I'm so happy Earth Breeze is a sponsor of our show because I simply love this game-changing product. I love it too. And, you know, it, it, it makes perfect sense because why 
Does laundry detergent come in these massive plastic jugs? They're heavy to carry. They're not very environmentally sound at all. And instead, you get these really great small sheets from EarthBreeze that you pop into the washer. No mess, no goo, so simple. Yeah, they're just slightly bigger than an index card. They look like dryer sheets, but they're not. They dissolve 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold. You just toss them in. Yeah, EarthBreeze has really made the concept of detergent better. The packaging is compact, it's biodegradable, and it's plastic-free, and the sheets are vegan and cruelty-free. We love EarthBreeze. And they're so sure that you're going to love it too. If you don't like it, EarthBreeze will give you a full refund. You don't even have to send it back. They are that confident that you'll love it as much as Robin does, as much as I do. Now's the time to try EarthBreeze because right now, our listeners can subscribe and save 40% off. Go to earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and Talkspace, the leading virtual therapy provider, celebrates every effort you make to improve how you feel and how you live. If you've been working on your mental health, or if you want to make progress towards a mentally healthier place, Talkspace is here for you. So obviously, I'm a big supporter of therapy. Whatever issue you're dealing with, it is something that everybody can benefit from. It is easy to get started with Talkspace. It's convenient to meet online wherever you're comfortable, it will make a difference in your life. There's no need to commute to appointments, miss time at work, or line up childcare in order to attend sessions. It's mental health care made easy. It's secure. They use the latest end-to-end bank-grade encryption technology to store client information and comply with the latest HIPAA regulations. Talkspace is also in-network with most major insurers. To celebrate Every step you take toward a better, richer, fuller life, Talkspace is offering every listener of this podcast $100 off your first month with Talkspace. So just go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster to match with a licensed therapist today. Go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster to get $100 off your first month. That's Talkspace.com slash Fluster. Okay, so now back to the show. Yeah, I always think about, we're talking about when you have the accurate information, does that truly help the catastrophizing? Because sometimes it does, because the truth is always never really as horrible as a good catastrophizer scenario. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the truth still just is a launching pad for a new catastrophic scenario too. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many lessons that I have learned from this and that I will continue to learn or so many observations that I've had from this. And I will tell you that going to see that orthopod on Tuesday, so I, my accident was on Sunday, on Tuesday, was the most enormously helpful thing that I could have done. And I give a lot of credit to his style, to his bedside manner to his absolute recognition that I was in tremendous pain and that I was in kind of panicking about this and his ability to say to me, I know exactly what this is. It is very clear to me. I'm going to show you what it is. I'm going to tell you what you need to do and you're going to be okay. That message of expertise was critical. Well, isn't that exactly what you say to your clients too? I do. I say, look, I know this. This is my bread and butter. I know that you feel overwhelmed and confused and it feels so big and scary. Let me tell you what's going on. Let me tell you how this thing works and let me tell you what we're going to do. And so when somebody parroted that language back to me and had that same style when I was in that very place, it was almost like there's been a lot of me sort of like being a person who broke their back and also being like, this is very good life experience for me to use. I mean, I'm always like, this is a really good metaphor, but it was incredibly powerful. So it just confirmed how helpful it is when somebody just gives you the information and takes you out of that scary place where you're spinning. And there's a message of hope with time and work and healing and practice. 
that you will not always feel this way. Correct. And panic, you know, the panic that I had in the middle of the night was really about not knowing where this was going to go and not knowing what was wrong with me and how I was going to recover from this. As soon as I got that information from somebody who was really, really skilled and clear, everything just calmed down. In my body, too. Things calmed down in my body, which was really, really helpful. How often would you say in the last 10 years have you stayed up in the middle of the night like that in a panic? I would say probably this was the most visceral panic that I had felt that I can remember. I mean, I certainly wake up and when my kids are going through things and I can ruminate about stuff and I certainly can wake up in the middle of the night and be frustrated or be angry at my husband because we had a fight or whatever. But this level of feeling panicky in the middle of the night, I don't know that I've felt that. Would you say in the other circumstances when you have had that middle of the night panic because one of your kids was going through something, Were you able to work yourself out of the panic sort of more with your own tools in a way that this one could not have happened? Yeah, because I know how to deal with catastrophic thinking. I know how to deal with ruminating. I know how to unhook from that cognitive pattern. I'm really good at it. I did not know how to unhook from this. I didn't have anything to tell myself that would make myself feel better. I didn't have the information and the physical pain was so intense. I didn't know how to unhook from that. So this felt really different in that way. But you imagine if somebody's having a panic attack, if somebody's kid is really struggling, if you've got a kid who's feeling suicidal, if you've got a kid who's, you know, really struggling, if you're really struggling and you don't know what to do and you don't know where it's going to go. I mean, I understand that. But that night at 1230, I really understood it. I really understood it. When you are dealing with families who are going through crises, of that magnitude where it it is visceral. Are there any other steps or things that you would recommend now? Because that happens. Yeah. I mean, I think that one of the things that I've tried to do, and I think I do pretty good with it, is that I want people to have some really concrete, solid information that they can go back to. So one of the things that I have found is that if somebody is emailing me or texting me, And they're really freaking out. I will text back. I have texted people, you know, if my phone is off and I've gone to sleep, but I've texted people and I've said, here's the words that I want you to keep repeating to yourself. And if you need to take this text out and read it again, read it over and over again, because what I am telling you is accurate. What I'm telling you is truthful. And I want you to stay connected to my words. And I've done that before. And I think that after I saw the orthopod and he told me, he gave me words, he gave me things that I could repeat to myself, I really had that same experience of him saying over and over and over again, I've said to myself, best case scenario, best case scenario. I've said that to so many people. I say, look, I fractured my back and they go, yeah. And then I say, look, if you have to fracture your back, this is the best way to do it. And those words just keep coming up over and over and over again. So let me ask you if this of the first five days of this, when you moved from like the panic and the crisis and then you got some information and you started really being able to use your skills. So your skills of emotional management that you've spent your life strengthening came into play, but I imagine other patterns still found their way in that you had to manage all or nothing. And tell us a little bit about like how those patterns showed up and how you responded to them. You know, I work a lot and my schedule is really busy and I say yes to a lot of things. And this happened on a Sunday before two of the biggest or three of the biggest weeks that I had planned in a long time. So there were a lot of really, really important things that I was supposed to do and that I needed to do. Yeah, I mean, they're public. One was your master class. Then it was the virtual screening and the debut of Anxious Nation, which you still did. And I have to say, when I finally saw you on screen, that was very comforting to see. Okay. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did it. That was the other night. I had a trip to California that I had to cancel. I've got an event coming up at my alma mater. There's a big women's alumni event that I'm speaking at. I think I'm going to be able to do that. I'm going to be on the Today Show in a few days. I think I'm going to be able to do that. 
but I had to cancel my calendar. I had to call people or email people and say, I can't do the thing that I'm supposed to do. I had another speaking event in Massachusetts that I had to cancel. It's interesting. I don't cancel things when a little something has gone wrong or I'm kind of sick. I don't cancel things. So that was really hard for me to do. I felt guilty about it. I felt like I was letting people down. I really felt sad about the things that I was missing that I really wanted to do or the things that I was going to miss. And of course, nobody said like, oh, come on, it's just a broken back, right? I mean, how bad can that be? Pretty bad. Yeah, but nobody, <laughs> I mean, nobody said that. There was even, actually, I will tell you that the event that I had to cancel in California, I was supposed to fly to California for two days and fly back. I offered to do it virtually. Now, looking back, there was no way in hell I would have been able to do a full day event virtually. I can't even believe, you know, and I think they were sort of like, we don't want broken back Lynn. I mean, why do they want me? They don't want me like, hi, let's talk about anxiety. I can barely move, but I mean, they didn't want that. I was aware of the fact that I kept trying to make things work. I think I'm still doing that a little bit. I'm trying to pay attention to it. Pay attention to it. I'm trying to pay attention to it. But yeah. And the other thing that I discovered, which shouldn't be a surprise, is that people are really willing to help. I got a lot of help. I got friends coming over. I got people bringing me meals, bringing me peanut M&Ms. I had one colleague sent me two books, another good friend sent me a book because she has a back issue. I mean, I just had so, so much support from people, which again, it didn't surprise me at all. I love these people. They're the most wonderful people in my life. But me asking for help and me saying like, I am really in trouble here. That was a little bit different for me. And it felt good to get the response that I got for sure. When the person who wants to take care of everyone has something happen, it's always like a spiritual lesson for that person. But it's also an opportunity for other people to figure out other methods where they don't rely on that person, too. Like if a mom with little kids does injure herself and then suddenly the mom's partner recognizes all the things he could do or she could do. These are moments that they have. They have a teaching part to it. Yeah, they do. No, I mean, there's a lot of lessons to be learned in this. There's one thing like uh, my very good friend uh, prior to this, there was a lot going on of a lot of stuff going on. And I had said to one of my friends about four days before I fell down the stairs, I said, oh, God, I feel like I've been hit by a truck. And she texted me and said, so here you go. You got hit by a truck. I don't feel like the universe made this happen in order to slow me down or that I needed to stop. I feel like I shouldn't have been wearing socks on the staircase. So I don't feel like this was some like cosmic lesson to get me to, you know, slow down. It is a cosmic opportunity. It is an opportunity. Yes. I don't feel like it was like pre-planned, but I do feel like it happened. And so there's things to be learned from it. I did text my boys the next day and said, hey, did either of you step on a crack yesterday? So, yeah. And my one son said, yeah, I did. I think I stepped on a crack, mom. I stepped on a crack. I broke your back. But yeah, I don't feel like there was this big, like that this was, this is what the universe did to me to get me to slow down. But it's what happened to me. And man, did I have to slow down. So there are lots of things to learn from something like this. Yeah, I, we don't have to discuss whether there's like predestination or determination. But the point is, stuff does happen. So how do you respond? Right. What do you learn from something that is disruptive? And what can you take away? I mean, I think we all did this as a culture during lockdown. So and this is just like a smaller, more acute version of a lockdown. It's happening to one person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My own personal lockdown, which was much more of a lockdown than I experienced during the lockdown. Well, when we come back, I want to talk parents having a child get hurt. That doesn't change regardless of age. So when we get back, let's just sort of talk about how to support the parents. So Robin, Mother's Day is on the way. And you know, we want to give our moms the best Mother's Day gift we can. And I'll tell you, Skylight Frame might just be the best gift 
at Mother's Day. Don't forget the grandmothers too. And I think one of the things that's awesome about it is that say if we're talking about a, a grandmother, you're talking about family members that are all over the country. Everybody can put their pictures on this one frame. It has a gorgeous 10 or 15 inch touch screen. It sets up in less than a minute. So even the least tech savvy are able to use this. You know, your kids are at a little league game. You're taking pictures. You can put them in. It's a way for relatives to just constantly be updated and see these beautiful pictures. There's no app or subscription required to send photos anytime from anywhere. So if you really want to stay connected to your family members, if you really want to give a gift to your mom, to your grandmother, to your favorite Aunt Tootie, you get 10% off, up to $30 off your frame when you go to skylightframe.com slash flusterclucks. That's right. To get 10% off up to $30 of your purchase of a skylight frame, just go to skylightframe.com slash Flusterclucks. That's S K Y L I G H T F R A M E, skylightframe.com slash Flusterclucks. Lynn, you don't have any tricky food allergies in your family, but do you know how expensive mayonnaise made without canola oil is? Because I'm going to tell you, if you go to the grocery store, it could easily be $11 a jar. Oh my gosh, I had no idea. Yeah. So Thrive Market is my go-to for all my grocery and household essentials. And the convenience of getting it all quickly shipped to my doorstep is a huge time saver and over time, a big money saver. I don't have any food allergies, but I'm picky about the foods that I bring into my house. And I'm picky about the cleaning products too. We are just not into bringing toxic chemicals into the house. And Thrive Market really is a great way to get those products consistently, conveniently. I always have them on hand. So on top of the massive savings on each order, I love that Thrive Market also has a deals page that changes daily. It gives me cash back on so many brands and they have a price match guarantee. So join Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. That's Thrive, T-H-R-I-V-E, market.com slash flusterclucks. Thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks. Okay, let's get back to this conversation. So we did an episode in the first season about a family hiking in the mountains together during lockdown and a boulder moved and actually moved and fell on one of the teenage daughters. The whole family experienced this accident, both emotionally and then the daughter physically. And you did a great job of helping the family have concrete steps to work through what was a very traumatic event for all of them. So if this type of thing we're talking about has come up in your family, I do recommend that you go back and listen to that episode and we'll put a link in the show notes. And there was also a great follow up to that episode, too. I think we talked about the mom got in touch with us and said that her daughter had actually gone hiking. They had worked, you know, she had healed from her injury, a broken bone, broken hip, I think. And so there was a really nice ending and a follow up to that. I think there's one thing that I'll just say in terms of parents going through this and me going through this also. And I've certainly done this as a parent. I have to stop myself as I was going through this. And I've, I would tell other parents to not do this. I'm sure I know my mom and dad were in this place too, is that we want to get sucked into the what if. Everything went okay. I'm going to be okay. It was really awful. It was really traumatic for my parents. I know that. But I have very much consciously and consistently resisted going to the what if place. And I think that's a really, really helpful skill for parents to know when you're dealing with something with your child, when your child gets hurt, when they need surgery. It is so easy to go down that path. Pull yourself back. I only have to think about what actually happened. I don't have to create a story that's worse than the story about what didn't happen. That's what anxiety wants you to do. That's what our imaginations want us to do. We do not have to go to the what if. I can be very clear about what happened. 
about the results of it. I don't have to create something worse than what actually happened. And I have consistently pulled myself back from that. So I had a a what if with my son that haunted me. I'm not imagining it haunted me for a long time after it happened because the what if he would have died, like the what if it would have been a horrific death. It didn't happen. And I remember talking to you about this. This was before we did the podcast. And I remember saying to you and sort of acknowledging, wow, like I'm stuck on this story. I'm happy to say I'm not stuck on it anymore. But I was really stuck on that story. And you said like every parent has that list of those close calls. The close call file. Yep, we all have it. So how do we manage that close call file? Well, it's going to pop up. Right. That's the thing is that we have to recognize this is what our brains are capable of. The reason that we're capable of having anxiety, the reason we're capable of ruminating and we're projecting into the future is because our brains are capable of imagining things that haven't happened or that didn't happen. Other animals don't do that. So we all have a close call file. It is a conscious choice, parents, to not go into the close call file. It's a conscious choice. Now, it will pop up. I had a similar experience when my kids were little. I think yours was worse, but mine, I have definitely have a few things in the close call file. And when it pops up, I say to myself, that's the close call file. Don't go there. There's that unhooking thing. There's nothing to be gained from imagining it. It's going to happen. And like I know, Robin, you were haunted by it, right? Because it was so potentially horrible. It's a conscious choice. And the other thing I think that you brought up, which is really important for people to hear, is it gets better over time. So the close call file, you know, if you read in the anxiety audit, the story that I tell about what happened in the first chapter about my close call that happened when the car went out into traffic, the more you think about it, the more that you lay down those pathways, the more that you create the story, the stronger it gets. So you want to make a conscious decision when it pops up to unhook from it and it gets better over time. Well, I also think it's important. Well, I mean, you can speak to this. I'm just going to share my own experience. So the close call thing happened before the podcast, before I had really done an anxiety audit on myself and worked with you every week since we launched, right? When you had your accident and we didn't know what was going on and I was catastrophizing, I knew I was catastrophizing. Look at you. I know. So I wasn't getting carried away. I was like, oh, and here's my catastrophizing showing up. Here's my this and this showing up. So right. So I and here's my overwhelm showing up. Like I knew all those patterns and called them out. And what I do think is cool is that the skills cumulatively stack on each other. If there is another close call, the skills that I have learned since then don't go away. I get to rely on them and kind of move through it a little more quickly, right? And so there's definitely a benefit to putting the work into this. And even when I was lying awake and I was really sort of panicking that second night after my injury, I knew what I was doing. And that probably helped a lot, actually, even though I couldn't fully pull myself out of it because I was in such pain, I knew what I was doing. And having that ability to observe, right? I say this a lot, the ability to step back from your thinking, the ability to create a little distance from the pattern, that's what therapy is about. And that is a really, really helpful skill. So even though you were catastrophizing, you were like, oh, I'm catastrophizing. And that allowed you to probably pull back from it and get a little distance from it, just like I was able to do at one in the morning. Right. It's like the anxious part of us was talking anywhere from 40 to 75%. And then the regular part of us was like, I see what you're doing here. And you can keep talking, but I see what you're doing until the normal part was like, I've had enough and we're going to pivot. And I think when I woke up that morning after my catastrophizing panic, it was clear to me, it was like, you know, you need to do something here. You need to get some more information. So you're going to text your friend and you're going to get some more information. Yeah. It was able to activate me to take some action that I needed to help, which wasn't comfortable for me. It wasn't comfortable for me to just ask her to do this for me. But it became clear I needed to do something. So that was super helpful also. Yeah, it's actually a great point of rather than what if, which we're going to do the what ifing, but if we do the what ifing and we say, okay, and then what? What is the action we take? Yep, what do I need right now? Yeah, it's been a very interesting journey. What do you think this would have looked like if you weren't a therapist specializing 
and anxiety management. I mean, you know, there are so many experiences that would have gone very differently if you just let it rip. I think I would have, let's see. I mean, I'm pretty good. I'm really good at pain management. So I think I can totally see why people take a lot of pain meds. And and even though I'm really good at that, it was really hard to manage the pain. I am good at bringing my body back down. So I was very aware of the fact that the more that I panicked, the worse that my pain was going to get. So I think if I had just let it rip, I think my pain would have been even worse. I think my muscle spasms would have been a lot worse. How would you have behaved differently at the hospital? Gosh, well, when I passed out, I definitely was able to tell them exactly what was going on. The poor LPN, I was like, I'm going to pass out now. I'm going to pass out now. And she was like, ah, it did freak everybody out because I guess I wasn't responsive for like 10 or 15 seconds. So that was very helpful to just let everybody know what was going on. I think I passed out from the pain. I'm not sure it was my usual squeamishness, but I don't know. I'm going to give myself a big pass on that one. I think that I was able to keep myself pretty focused. I was able to stay in the present moment when I was in the hospital. I think I was able to make good decisions. I think I was able to keep myself in a non-panic place for a good chunk of time after it happened. And I think that was based on the fact that I know how this thing works and I know how it spirals. And spiraling could have been pretty bad because it would have also scared the rest of us, right? Like, Correct. Because you would have been really filled with fear and projecting that fear and it would have made everything much worse. Yeah, it would have made everything much worse. Yeah. I often say when I'm talking to people about their amygdala and their prefrontal cortex, I will say, look, when you walk into the emergency room, you're bringing in your amygdala and you want to be met with a whole bunch of people who are in their prefrontal cortex. And that was absolutely my experience of the people that were helping me. And it was actually very much what I was aware of as I was going through it, that I needed to stay as much as I could in my prefrontal cortex so that I didn't spiral out of control. If anyone hasn't listened to our fainting episode, fainting is sort of like a thing with Lynn and my husband and other members of their family. And I actually want to bring up something kind of fascinating. It's a parallel. You could have fainted because the nurse was like, yeah, go to the bathroom. She's fine. And you know how you said, I'll show you and you fainted? (laughs) Yeah. My husband once fainted because they were like, you're fine. Go ahead and get up right after a surgery. And it was premature for him. He did not feel ready to get up and he fainted as well. So the fainting was like, oh, yeah, I'll show you. Yeah. Hold my beer. There was a there was a part of me really when she said when she handed me over to the LPN and she was like, yeah, she found some stairs. She's a little bruised up. I was like. That is not an accurate description of what's going on with my body. Yeah, I definitely was like, yeah. Right in that moment. So it's just, it was interesting because that's very much what happened to your brother. His last episode that he fainted. Yeah. Which was fortunately several years ago now. You guys keep life interesting. We do keep life interesting. (laughs) Yeah, we do keep life interesting. The other funny thing that happened is that I really, like prior to going to the bathroom, them taking me to the bathroom, I really had to pee. For like three hours, I really had to pee. They didn't want to move me at all. I was in the hospital bed. They didn't want to move me at all until they got the CAT scan report back because they didn't know what was going on with my spine. So finally, I got the CAT scan report back. And so I'm waiting to go to the bathroom and I'm hitting the call button like I'm going to wet the bed here. And my husband saw this button in the right by my bed that said help. And he thought, well, that seems like a good button to push. And that was the code button. So he pressed that button (laughs) and... Everybody came running into my room and they're like, what's the problem? What's the problem? And and he said, she just, her bladder is really full. And the nurse goes, oh my God, that's not the button to push if you have to go to the bathroom. And he's like, but it, see, it seemed appropriate. Yeah. And he said, she really does have to go. So she was like, oh my God. So then they took me to the bathroom and then I passed out and they called another code because I'm unconscious. So it was, I'm sure they were like, get this person out of here. Although, honestly, I think I did pretty darn well under the circumstances. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad I can tell everybody with confidence. She's not making this up. She's much better in two weeks and she will heal. We're just so grateful for that. Yeah, I am so grateful too. One thing, though, that that has had an impact, we sent an email out for those on our retreat list, but we 
are going to need to postpone fall's retreat because many of the things Lynn will be rescheduling will now have to happen in the fall and schedules are tricky. So we're very sorry that we will miss the opportunity to convene at Canyon Ranch this fall, but stay tuned for dates in the future. And also, I am doing two virtual parenting classes in the fall. I don't have the exact dates yet, but I'm going to be doing some parenting stuff in the fall. So keep your eye out for that as well. If this episode was helpful to you, you can join our Facebook community and we'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn. 